Good morning. Welcome. It's good to see everybody out today. Uh, Kyle, as uh, Director of Campus Security, there's a table over here I'm concerned about. We've got Dale, we've got Jerry, we've got Mark. Michael, I don't know, you're gonna be judged by the company you keep. Oh boy, they are in trouble. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about a lot of issues um, and uh, hopefully give you insights that perhaps you feel like we've been withholding from you. That's never been our intention, but um, an effort to improve communication as well as a sense of community. So I hope that you find this helpful and I welcome your critiques, suggestions afterwards, you know, about how we can um, improve in this area. So very briefly, I'll send you out more information, probably more than you wanna know. Um, what's happened or what is happening since the Clark Report came out? And one of the things we've done is, um, and really, I've just focused on mine. Um, Bryce, Kim, Linda have been doing uh, their activities parallel to what I've been doing. So there's really a lot more than what I'm showing here. Trying to get opportunities to meet with you, either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And believe me, that has been very valuable to me. You've given me insights that I just simply haven't had in the past. It's very uncomfortable for me. You know, when I came here in 2012, I thought I was gonna do some good things. I thought I was gonna implement this culture of inquiry where we could talk candidly about issues without putting each other on the defensive without assigning blame. And apparently I didn't do that. And for that, I apologize. I, I just wish I'd done better. So these are attempts to do better. And one of the major ones is we've hired Linda Seppa Salisbury, consultant out of Spokane Community Colleges, and she has tremendous experience, successes working with leadership teams. And so she started to work with our executive team. That's the president and the three vice presidents. And now some of you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, well, what about the rest of us? Why are you just working with those four? Go back to the report. The problem isn't with you. The problem is with leadership. We've lost trust. We've lost respect. So in working with Linda, we've decided that what we need to do is try to get our house, our affairs in order before we start to work with everybody else. Now those opportunities will come. We've already been talking about possibilities of bringing in opportunities for the whole campus, but um, you know, we've got to start at the source. And um, so that's why we're focusing on the four um, executive team members. <clears throat> In executive team, cabinet, shared governance council, we are continuing to work and address the themes. Um, we continue to solicit ideas suggestions, insights. The board has made this a regular agenda item. They are monitoring this closely and they've made it abundantly clear to the president that this is important and we need to make improvement. 
Now, some people may think, oh yeah, you're doing this because of the report. You gotta do it because the trustees. There is that element, but ultimately we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. If we really are going to live up to our values, our commitment to students, employees, then these are the right things, the right steps to take. And so it's not that we're doing it grudgingly because the report says we need to, or we're doing it because the trustees are making us, it's the right thing to do. So I hope that as you see some of the things that Bryce and I will be talking about this morning, Linda, um, Kim, Kim doesn't have a role this morning? Okay. All right. We could create one for you. <laughs> Surprise. Um, so anyhow, I hope that you see that there is a sincere effort to improve in the areas of communication, community, accountability. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bryce, who's going to take us into the next section. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have a few different announcements and I want to start off with Libby. Libby had asked for a few moments and then Linda Schoonmaker and then Stephen McFadden. Do you need a mic? Okay, so you guys probably know I'm gonna talk about a book. <laughs> so One Book, One College author Erica Sanchez is coming this Wednesday. And the only reason we're really lucky to have her is because she was gonna be at Central. So we just kind of grabbed her and said, can you come here? So please um, try to make an effort to come. The big um, meeting with her is at three o'clock on Wednesday. And I know that's not an ideal time, but Nothing really is ideal, right? So um, we're really excited. Um, she's the author of a young adult novel called I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter. And I know that the English classes that have read it have really, uh, the students have really responded to it. And um, so we're super excited about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is Allison Palumbo is going to be doing two presentations called uh, From Gatekeeper to Guide, The Role That Faculty and Staff Biases Play in the Student Learning Experience. And these are on May 10th at 10.30 and another one on the 16th at three. And they're about an hour and a half long, I think, and you can get PDUs and it's gonna be great. So that's me. Yes, and the author will be signing the book after the three o'clock presentation, if you have one. CTC Link. Okay, I'm going to take 10 seconds here. <clears throat> so CTC Link is a business transformation project, and it mostly affects the administrative services, but it's also going to affect everyone on campus, including our students, because they'll do a lot more in self-serve, and so will all of the college employees. But the super users, the people in financial aid and student services and counseling and the business office and IT, they're gonna be affected the most. Just wanted to cover that. So <clears throat> there are six deployment groups. We are in deployment group five. We are currently in the initiation phase. We've completed 12% of that, yay. Um, we will be in that phase until October of 19. And then we go into peer review, and so other colleges will take a look at how, how far we've come and whether we are ready to go. <clears throat> By November, they'll decide, yay or nay, we're ready, um, and they'll give us official entry into that deployment group. And then we start the implementation phase in January of 2020. And then in December of 2020, it will be a go, no-go decision. And then we would go live in February of 2021. So we have a CTC uh, Link Big Bend project team who are just getting things marked on their calendar. We haven't met yet, but we're 
getting ready to do that in the next week or two. And that is Star Bernhardt, Valerie Parton, Rita Ramirez, Angela Garza, Kim Garza, Matt Killebrew, Elliot Davidson, Jeremy Kelly, and Charlene Rios. And, and then everybody else will be SMEs and they'll come into the project as we have activities going on. There's going to be a ton of work and people are going to be stressed because they've got a lot of crap that needs to get done. And uh, just wanted to kind of give you a heads up to cut people a little bit of slack because they're going to be super busy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If you don't know, I'm Stephen McFadden. I'm a trustee here at Big Ben. Um, in September, I finished my seventh year of service. And it's also casual Friday, which means I almost never wear a tie and I certainly never wear a jacket. But for the trustee's role, I uh, pulled it back out of the closet. As trustees, we can't say thank you enough, nor can we demonstrate our gratitude enough for the amazing work that the staff and the faculty do here at Big Bend. We have that role of oversight of the community college, and we are likely not down in the trenches shaking hands and saying thank you enough. So from my world to yours. Thank you so much for what you do here at Big Bend. It really drives everything about this community college. Behind every monitoring report and every commencement, there's a small army of staff and faculty who have rolled up their collective sleeves to help transform the lives of students. Transforming those students' lives is the most important thing to me. It's the reason I add trustee meetings to my everyday calendar alongside my own professional obligations. Thank you for those amazing things you do and the lives you ch touch. I'm joining you this morning to encourage you to help us honor students who have overcome great adversity and found a path to success as a student here at Big Ben. Soon, you'll all be invited to nominate students for the state's Transforming Lives Award. Between now and then, I encourage you to be thinking about students to nominate, students who managed to hurdle their barriers while on a path to change their life for the better. Please nominate them. We love to celebrate these students. We can always celebrate more the achievements of our students. That's why we gather them and their families for a banquet here every year, regardless of whether they're selected for the state honor. We need to honor every nominee for their achievements. We don't have nominees if you don't look around the campus and consider the students that are here or the students who have recently reached their goal and choose to nominate them. I look forward to reading those nominations every year, but to be quite honest, it's really difficult to read some of those heart-wrenching, tear-jerking nominations and pick just one to send to the state for a nomination and a consideration as an award winner. They're all award winners. The minute they set foot on campus the very first time, they already had a positive forward achievement. The student success stories here are many. This is just one way, one amazing way for us to tip our hat to those who have really overcome great challenges and adversity. So my message to you today is when you receive the an invitation to nominate a student, please do. Please consider the students that deserve an extra round of applause, an extra bump, and some additional acknowledgement for whatever it is they've accomplished. Those students and you are the reason I'm here as a trustee. I believe in this community college with all my heart. I'm here for five more years, God willing, thanks to being recently reappointed. 
And I believe next July, I get to switch from the vice chair to the chair's role one more time. And I wanna make sure that we continue to build a positive head of steam in the name of student success. That happens because of all of you. Thank you so much and have a great day today. So I'd like to make a couple of quick comments about uh, our accreditation visit that is coming up in fall 2020. We, this is our comprehensive visit that uh, we all know, oh boy, we've known about for some time. There, hopefully I won't shriek at us. So the Northwest Commission, our regional accrediting body, has, is coming out with new standards that they're planning to adopt in Jan this upcoming January of 2020. And when you look at the new standards versus the old standards, the, the standards we're currently under, they, uh, there's a couple of significant differences. So I just want to give you a quick overview on that. The, the new standards are not as prescriptive as our current standards. Um, but they're still based on the idea of continuous improvement, uh, self-evaluation, assessment, and so forth. And at a recent training that I attended with uh, Valerie Parton uh, that the commission put on helping colleges prepare for their comprehensive visit, they have taken their approach to, accredit to accreditation visits and kind of put into two categories. One is there's a compliance piece, and this is where they're monitoring on behalf of the Department of Ed, the federal government, all the policies, procedures we need to have in place to be compliant with the federal laws that govern um, our receipt of uh, financial aid funds, uh, Clery, and several other federal laws that, that govern us. And so they've got these lengthy checklists of, of things that we need to have in place. And they wanna, and so as part of our report, our reporting will report on all of these things and they want to see that we have all these policies, procedures in place. We'll send that to them months before the visit. The visit will probably be in October, it'll be fall of 2020. So sometime next summer, we'll be sending in our report and it'll have, and we'll have this list of things that we need to, to tell them that we have in place. Most of that work is administrative. Um, again, when you're talking about policies, procedures, we also think from financial aid, some things from safety, some things from the business office, from academics, but it's all pretty administrative. Then the focus, and so they want to get as much of that done before the visit as possible. If they go through the list, say, yes, you've got this, this, that, and the other, then we're good. And so then when they come to, for, to visit for the two days, what they're really focusing on is institutional improvement, continuous improvement, assessment, evaluation. So all the things that we were really focusing on last year that you guys did such an incredible, incredibly great job doing in, in assessment and evaluation, that's what they want us to, that's what they're going to focus their visit on. And so in preparation for that, we're really in a pretty good spot considering it wasn't always fun, but we did a lot of work over the past few years to put in place um, assessment, evaluation, continuous improvement model within instruction, within the department south side of instruction, and across the institution overall. So as long as we're working our plan, our processes that we've put in place, then we'll be in a very good spot for our accreditation visit. So want to recognize all of you for the good work that you've done thus far and say so that in this upcoming year, as we can, if we just continue to work our processes and you'll be doing the work that you need to do in your part of the world to help prepare us for our 2020 accreditation visit. So again, thank you for the great work you've done so far. So at this point in the agenda, we're going to 
talk about advising, and I'd like to invite those that are helping to present to come on up. Um, as you all know, we've been doing an awful lot in the area of advising for several years. For that uh, started well before I showed up, and we've been able to leverage our Title V grants to help move this work forward and have some positive impacts across the institution. So we have a variety of folks, uh, counseling advising, some of the deans who are gonna talk to us a little bit about where we're at and some of the things that are coming up and coming with that. In your agenda, it lists several different um, present, mini presentations, and we've changed the order of that slightly. There's a, a graphic on your tables. It's a black and white version of this. And you'll see one, two, three, four, five. So the, the presentations are going to follow this order rather than the order that's on your agenda. So with that, I'll turn the time over to the group. Okay, good morning. Uh, it's good to see everybody in one room. We get so busy with our day-to-day -day work that we don't get to, a chance to visit, so this is good. Um, we, as a counselor, um, a lot of what we do in the Counseling Center is advising along with our colleagues, some that are up on the stage and, of course, a few others that are um, at the table there. But one of the things that we thought we would do is, as we know, one of our main efforts that we're working on on campus is improving the advising experience for students, all in the effort of getting students um, to you know, achieve their educational goals that they've set forth for themselves uh, once they enter Big Bend to get to that celebration for graduation. So what we have for you is just some information that things and activities that we've done to be able to help us um, prepare the services that we offer students. So this is advising through the Counseling Center. So the first thing we wanna share with you, and some of you may know this already, but in winter of 18, we actually posted an advising survey on Canvas so that all students could um, have the opportunity to share with us a little bit about their experience. So we had 399 students complete the survey, which actually for us was pretty exciting. Um, there was lots of information that we gathered, but of the things that were super important was that 91% of the students who completed the survey had indicated that they could identify the name of the degree or the certificate that they were completing. And that was super important for us because we were trying to say, you know, if you're attending Big Ben, what degree are you completing? You all heard the answer. What do students usually say? The AA or associate degree. So we wanted a little bit more definition about what's the degree they're really trying to complete specifically. Um, and when we think about areas of interest and we think about guided pathways and we think about the certificate program that they're completing, that question becomes really important. Um, the next one was 88% um, percent of students indicated that they understood the requirements needed for their degree um, or their certificate. So again, it's taking courses that they need to complete and satisfy the requirements so they're not taking courses that aren't necessary. Um, and then the last one on this screen is 83% of students indicated they were able to access their advisor prior to their registration date and time. And again, that was high on our list simply because we have had mandatory advising for a few years now. And while we think it's a good idea, you know, are we, is it a barrier for students to be able to register? And at least, you know, 83% of the students who completed the survey are saying that they were indeed able to meet with their advisor. And then we do every spring for a few years now, we do a little in-house counseling center um, survey regarding advising and accessing services. And the question that we wanted to share with you of the 47 students that completed the survey, um, all students had indicated that they were able to access the information regarding the, re the degree requirements. So do they know where to look on the website? You know, and, Granted, we have to show them where the catalog is located and how to find an advising map or where to click on the link for programs so they can see what's required. These students were able to tell us uh, that they indeed knew when they left our office that they'd be able to access that information. And then this was really fun. In spring of 18 last year, we actually conducted two advising um, focus groups. 
one group was for students with more than 45 credits and the other group was for students with less than 45 credits. And of that, as the counselors met to kind of, you know, go through the information and find out what would be, you know, the areas that really resonated with us that we thought we wanted to focus on and that was the continued theme and message students were telling us. And there were three. One was degree planning, the other communication, and the other is the desire to plan for academic success. So under degree planning, students shared with us the value of using degree audit with their advisor. It helped them understand what the requirements were needed for their degree. Um, they talked about the importance and how that tool helped them with not only planning um, a year's worth of classes, so degree planning for the year, but in many cases there were students saying that they really wanted to see what a full two-year plan looked like. Under communication, of course this is just one of those standard things, better communication on campus. So that was an issue um, that came up. And then they talked about it would be helpful if advisors initiated that communication with them, um, particularly around scheduling an appointment. You know, how do they schedule an appointment with you, for example? Um, the third one under communication wants to know the benefits of receiving advising. That one was a kind of an aha moment for me because we talk about mandatory advising, we talk about why it's important among us, but are we sharing that with students in terms of what the significance is and how it will benefit them? So that came up several times. Uh, frustration when emailing advisor, especially if they didn't get a reply back. Uh, frustration with not knowing how and where to locate their advisor, so things like office hours and location, that information um, was something they were addressing. And then, of course, there was the issue of if an advisor had office hours but it wasn't convenient for the student, um, how they would, you know, navigate that. And then students suggested an alternative method of um, communication as being important. So we all use Canvas, or many of us use Canvas in classes. Um, use of social media, and then the use of Remind, so using that system as a way to be able to get information to students. Um, and believe it or not, students expressed a benefit in using their Big Ben email. Now, you know we don't have a policy that says that is our one and only way of communicating with students, but the students who attended just exp did express some benefit in being able to use that. So the desire to plan for academic success. Um, they really talked about the need to plan for next steps. So after Big Ben, what? If I'm going into the world of work or I'm transferring to university, help me make those plans. Um, understanding the importance of advising and building a rapport with their advisor was important. Um, and I think all of us here would agree that that's a, a key a element to a good advising situation and relationship. So advising, degree planning, and registration process, all that information students talked about how it helps them take responsibility and be accountable for their college success. So the more we're able to share that information, the more they're able to take that on themselves. And then under other, I do have um, a couple of notes. One is students didn't express frustration in the requirement for having mandatory advising to meet with their assigned advisor. Um, but they, again, did talk about, just help us understand why that's important. Um, why advising is important. And then the last one on here, I think as we think about other ways of being able to reach out to our students, I think is another one that's really very important, and that is students express the importance of advising taking place in an environment where they felt comfortable, they felt welcomed and understood, and then lastly, that the advisor understood what their commitments were outside of um, their experience here at Big Bend. Great, so we're gonna move on to the next slide, which is gonna, um, fall of 2018, the Big Bend Counseling Center um, conducted a student satisfaction survey describing their advising experience. So I just wanna highlight a few numbers here. Um, we know that a little over 50% of students strongly agreed to the following statement. When I enrolled at Big Bend, I developed a plan to complete my degree and or certificate. 52% um, of students um, indicate or strongly agreed to um, knowing the requirements, um, that they are clear and understandable. A little over 52% of students uh, strongly agree that their academic advisor is knowledgeable about the transfer requirements of other schools. And the um, next question that we asked was, um, or students indicated that strongly agreed, 60% of students strongly agreed that their academic advisor is knowledgeable about the program requirements. 
And we know that um, nearly 52% of students strongly agreed to the statement of their, um, my academic advisors concerned about my success as an individual. And nearly 53% of students strongly agreed that their academic advisor is available to them, whether that's face-to-face, -face, telephone, or in person at a time that's convenient for them. And the nice thing here, um, so nearly 65% of students strongly agree that they know who their academic advisor is. So um, you know, this, this information here indicates that students, their experience has been positive um, and they're satisfied with what the efforts that uh, we've been providing them. Can I just add something? You get, two, you get a bonus point if you notice that satisfaction is spelled wrong up at the top there. But we should say where this came from. Um, this was not counseling center survey so we do have a fall 2018 student satisfaction survey that goes out to all students and Edgar I think it was like 491 students um, had um, completed the survey so it's a lot of students with a lot of information and I don't know but I think when you put the blue and the darker teal green together when you compare the responses for agree or strongly agree which is what you see I think I was quite pleased Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Ann Ganazi, and I'm the STEM Advising Specialist and I work with the Transforming STEM Pathways Grant, and I'm in the Counseling and Advising Office. And I need to change the slide. Okay. Uh, a project that I worked on this year was just getting a snapshot of how we're providing advising to STEM students to help prepare them to transfer from Big Bend into a STEM uh, bachelor's degree. And so we chose to look at uh, the completion of transfer education plans and how that advising was happening. And so a transfer education plan is bridging the degree planning that Marianne was just talking about with the requirements of a baccalaureate degree. And this is important for all students, but uh, especially important for STEM students because so many of the classes that they take are built on interdisciplinary prerequisites where they might need a math class or a chemistry class or a biology class here or even a series of courses before they would be able to be junior ready in the bachelor's degree or be able to be certified into a certain bachelor's degree. So we developed um, a project that advisors helped with across campus the query of students include any student who had identified as a STEM or healthcare um, area of interest in the summer new student registrations, any student that was pursuing an associate in science transfer one or two degrees, so that covers natural sciences uh, and engineering, uh, students doing an associate in of arts and science, MRP in pre-nursing and computer science, and I left off, sorry Tom, associate in applied science systems admin should be on there too, STEM, associate in applied science transfer ag, or any student that was completing a STEM focused class that would indicate to us that they're probably are STEM bound, but probably working on a DTA degree. So that included Math 142, Chem 161, Bio 221, Engineering 110, and Physics 221. So out of that big query, we identified 435 students, and that spanned over 41 advisors across campus. So many of you in the room um, helped to participate in this project. We gathered the list in fall quarter, and then an email was sent out at the beginning of winter quarter asking for advisors' participation. Um, and so each advisor received the email with a spreadsheet and that spreadsheet included all of their students that had been indicated on this list and asked that they look through their advising notes to see if they had completed a transfer education plan with those students already if they were not in mandatory advising or if they were in mandatory advising to ensure that a transfer ed plan was completed during their winter advising for spring quarter the advisors returned that information to us um, and they reported if the transfer ed plan was complete, incomplete, if it was no longer applicable in this particular study because the student had transitioned out of a STEM transfer plan and maybe was looking at a different degree plan so we were just weren't including them in these numbers, 
or if they did not meet with the student. Um, and so we, we gathered that data and then we took it a step further. And for any student that was reported as did not meet with their advisor, had an incomplete transfer ed plan, or we did not receive data back from that advisor, then we looked through ADP notes to see if that student had met with another advisor on campus um, to complete the transfer ed plan. Um, and, and we also contacted students directly, just in case the note wasn't put into ADP, but that student had met with an advisor to collect data to just make sure it was as complete as possible. We also did a secondary survey that went out to the 435 students asking about their advising experience, who they were meeting with, if it was their assigned advisor or someone else on campus, and what resources they were utilizing to complete their transfer ed plan. So once we took out the students that were no longer working on transferring into a STEM bachelor's program, we ended up with 317 students. Out of those, 222 had completed a transfer ed plan, which got us to 70% completion, which is a great number. 207 of those 317 went to a professional advisor, for lack of a better term, that included uh, counseling, faculty, myself, Jen, um, program coordinators. Out of those 207, 171 had completed transfer ed plans, so that was an 83% completion rate. And of the stu 110 students that went to instructional faculty, 52 had completed a transfer ed plan with 47% completion rate. Out of those 52, when we were looking through ADP, 31 of those were completed by a professional advisor, uh, which brought the number to 19% of students that had met with instructional faculty had a completed transfer ed plan. In the student survey, we asked, who do you get advising from? And there were 139 responses. 55% of all of the students, and now this included workforce ed because this included the original group before we had taken out the NAs. 55% had met with their assigned advisor and 45% had met with multiple advisors or not their assigned advisors. When we broke that down based on the track that they were in, workforce ed students, had, we had 31 responses. 68% of those had met with their assigned advisor, 32% with not their assigned advisor or multiple advisors. And for transfer, we had 108 responses, 53% were with their assigned advisor, 47% were not assigned advisor or multiple advisors. So, there's some information that we can kind of take away from this and be able to utilize as we're looking at what our advising practices look like and um, any changes that we're making, just to understand that first off is advising assignments range significantly over campus. I know I got lots of emails back from advisors in areas outside of STEM that are like, wait, why do I have STEM students coming to me? <laughs> Um, because there were 41 advisors included in this. As we can see, about 50% of our students are receiving advising from more than one advisor or multiple advisors, which kind of makes sense um, because and there might be a scheduling conflict um, with, a, with their assigned advisor, and then once they develop a, a relationship with a different advisor and they may just keep going to that person and it's not formally getting reassigned. That also would include any students that also have like a trio advisor or they come to me with specific questions and then all of a sudden they have multiple advisors that they're going to. Um, and lastly, we can see that advising practices really vary across campus. Uh, we saw this pretty consistently through documentation that was happening in ADP, Advisor Data Portal, um, and we saw it with the, the completion of the Transfer Education Plan and Degree Completion Plan program, so thank you.
I didn't introduce myself. My name's Henry Gattison. I'm one of the counselors as well, so I apologize. So I'd like to talk about um, some of the practices uh, that are guiding or some of the strategies and, and uh, tools that we're using to help students and guiding our practice with the advising here. So currently we have 147 Running Start students who have opted to receive Remind uh, text alerts. So that's information regarding advising. When should they be advising? It's time to meet with their um, with their assigned advisor, verification forms need to be submitted, et cetera. Um, group advising for Running Start students is being offered. So um, the focus is to provide educational planning and degree completion within a timely manner. The use of a student success checklist um, when advising new students. So this is something that was developed nearly two years ago and we're using it. It gives a month by month breakdown of what students should be completing, important dates, tasks, et cetera. Um, students are receiving an email from an advisor uh, a week prior, uh, or during a uh, week prior to registration. And so it's sending them uh, information on how to advise, how to seek out their advisor. Um, students are developing an education plan with their advisor um, when they meet with us. And that's also being documented in ADP, which is, uh, makes it really nice when we're working and um, we see that there's an ed plan that's being, uh, that's indicated in ADP and we may be able to ask that advisor, hey, what did you work on or what courses did you select? What was the advice that you gave? So that's really nice. Um, emails regarding campus resources or events uh, may be sent out to students and the use of out of office reply. So if a student tries to email or get in contact with their advisor, they're receiving this message. And, and the, the message also um, will have when they can meet with their advisor, when they plan on being back and how to contact their advisor. So it's just a really good practice that um, some of us have incorporated. And the biggest thing here is consistency and not releasing pins to students without an advising session. Um, you know, some students may be receiving that pin without going through a detailed education plan or advising session with um, an advisor. And that's it's really important that they, they, um, they receive that advising. So I think that's one thing that we've all practiced. Um, students aren't going to get away with an email. Could you please send me your pin, uh, my pin or a telephone call? No, it's going to be a 30 to 45 minute advising session with the student going over a detailed education plan for completion of their degree. So next, I'd like to pass this off to some of the deans. Okay, so what you're looking at is Big Ben's Students Achievement Strategies, and there should be some copies on your tables. And um, moving from the advising tips and um, data that we've just heard about, now we're moving into some of the strategies that Big Bend um, has been working on, is working on, and some areas that we still need to work on. So that's kind of, and uh, like Bryce said earlier, that's the kind of the flow for the rest of the rest of the hour. So one of the things um, that we all know is that um, student success starts at the, that first contact and ends when they leave Big Bend. So that's really what we're looking at um, today. And a lot of what you're going to hear about is support for that process, but also support for faculty and staff as we are supporting our students. So I'm gonna hand it off to Kathleen. Our focus with uh, looking at our advising model has been to broaden our, just as Deneen has said, broaden our look uh, to how we touch our students all along the way. Um, but my discussion is about advising again. Um, it was um, referred a little bit by Anne that advising is, um, the assignments of advising are very broad and sometimes you can be advising some a student from lots of different areas. Um, I looked at advisor assignments and how many um, as advisees each faculty and each advisor, uh, each staff advisor had on campus. And so I wanted, it was just data. Uh, I worked with um, Debbie Simpson to get this data and I wanted to show you in a representation of advisor assignments. So I put it into a word cloud 
and with the number of advisees a person had. So if a person had more advisees, their, their advisor code would show up more uh, or larger in the representation. So this is what, uh, so uh, this represents our advisor assignments. And there's, uh, and I used advisor codes uh, um, and you might be able to find your your um, your advisor code there. Usually, it's your last th first three letters of your last name and your first initial, with some exceptions. But uh, as can be expected, our counselors have the majority have a, a very large advising load. Our counselors and also Jen De Leon for workforce. I thought, okay, if we and if we take that out, I wanted to try to get look at faculty advising and what are the loads for faculty. And so I took out, so this was to be completely inclusive of all the advising, but then I thought, okay, I'm gonna take out Jen De Leon and the three faculty counselors because their numbers are so large they dwarf everyone else. And so um, I did another representation. And this represents faculty, other advisors that have advised uh, through different programs like um, ECE, um, nursing. Um, and you can still see we have, uh, we have differences in how, how many advices we have. Some of it is the nature of the workforce program that they're in. For example, you can see John Mark Swedberg, he advises everybody in aviation. And so, so that puts him the biggest tier of the, of the um, instructional faculty. Um, but, and Jenny Nyswanger, she has a lot of advising within her program. So there are some disparities, uh, dif differences. Um, I'll show it one more way. And this is less readable, but this is the raw data. So I just alphabetized the advisors. And you can see the counselors are there way up, uh, almost to 200 or above. And, but when you look across the board, even if we look at the, one, the, the majority of those folks that are 30 to 40 and below, we see we don't have evenness in advisor assignments. And given the fact that we are, um, we have, mandatory advising now for the first 30 credits, this represents a difference in workload for uh, our faculty and staff that are doing advising. So uh, one of the things we're doing is looking at how we assign advisees, looking at moving uh, to a different way of assigning advisees in some of the areas of interest. We're not really changing how we sign advisees for the workforce program. They're going to advise the people in their program, programs like they always have. We're more looking on the transfer side of the house and how we can uh, figure out and make um, advising loads a bit more even. That's going to entail some things. Um, it's going to entail that some of you may be assigned to advise in an area that's not your primary area. Uh, Ryan Leonard has 74 advisees. And that is more than some full-time advisors have. Um, so well, we need some other faculty that would be trained, work with Ryan Leonard to be trained so that they could advise, especially those first three quarters when it's the mandatory advising to advise. And so we are moving forward with that. We, and another area would be 
We need to look at how our running start students are being advised. Our counselors have um, are doing wonderful jobs meeting the needs of our running start students, but that is taking a huge huge load on them during those advising weeks. So we may be training some fa some other faculty to um, learn about how to advise running start students. And the plan is as we start assigning new advisee, as you're assigned advisees, if you're assigned an advisee, uh, advisees specifically in a certain area that you wouldn't know things about, we would, by next fall, when we come back, we'll let you know about those assignments, and then hey, there'll be opportunities for you to receive training so that you can be fully prepared come the time to advise for winter, that you can shadow the counselors or Shadow Ryan Leonard or have some training sessions so that you can be trained to advise in places, in topics and areas that you're not yet trained. So that's the work we're trying to do, looking at, um, looking at advice, advisor assignments. Okay. Um, Tammy's next. Good morning, I'm Tammy Napionic, Director of Title V Grants. And I am gonna show you some work that we have been working on um, for the website. A component of our grant is to do some work on the website to make it more accessible for students in an effort really to help them gain as much information that they can from the web in a more efficient way, a better student experience on the web in hopes that that would help advisors um, in their time that they meet with students and the questions where students come and um, sit before them and that perhaps they might be able to get that information ahead of time. So I have a couple of things to show you on some things that we've started on. And as it sits today, we've been working on the getting started checklist. Some of you have seen this before, and um, this is where a lot of the work that we're doing right now has centered around so that we can make sure that this information is the most current because, of course, it's going to drive all the other things that occur on the web. So this document is not final. It's still in a draft form. Uh, hopefully on Monday we'll have all of the items correct, all the language correct. Um, all the links are not live, of course, and they don't all go to pages that are completely developed at this point. So, but this is driving all of that work. So this is what the Getting Started Checklist will look like, and it can be emailable, and then the links will work. Now let me show you what it will look like on the web. Bear with me, I have not had the greatest luck with these videos, so, oh, it's gonna work, all right. So, <laughs> uh, so this is what the page will ultimately look like, and um, students will be able to go to this page on a link called Getting Started, and then all that information that you just saw in the Getting Started checklist will be in these drop-downs. So you can see that um, some of the items, for example, the academic and student resources at the bottom, that's not a live page at this point. That would be an example of something that is in the process of being developed. All of this work has happened through committees and um, lots of emailing back and forth and um, lots of versions. So this is where we sit now. Um, the content initially, that we centered on for to start this work was around those pre-admission of future students. So the students who are coming here who've never been here before, what are those steps to get started? And so that's where this work has, has begun. Of course, a lot of this work will also fall under the current students. So just through natural evolution of developing this, that some of that 
content will also be altered as well. We've been to lots of different um, departments and had just an incredible amount of feedback and response from this. So I'd like to also show you what the running start looks like as well. Um, okay. And call and pay um, to for the thirty dollars. This is the one you're speaking about, yeah. Absolutely. If this isn't a final document. Um, I'll have all of the feedback in this document, hopefully by the end of today, but probably Monday. But thank you for that. Good to know. Thank you. And you've reviewed this several times, right? So back to the running start, this is what it looks like. And then I'll show you the page that it would look like to simulate it on the website. So very similar to the page that you saw before, the drop downs. There's a frequently asked questions down at the bottom so students can get as much information as they can on this page before coming here or from their counselors. Also, what a great resource for K-12. All right, thank you so much. Anne? Okay. So, um, I'm not sure where that sheet went up here. Is that? Three. The sheet that you have um, on your tables that's outlining this. Okay, so under initial contact, um, one of the sections is the getting started information sessions. And so this was born from a fairly large committee now of faculty advisors and administrators that have been meeting since November um, to talk about what students need to know and when it's a first year student experience group. And so out of that was born the new student information guide that, or what students need to know and when it's had two different names that many of you have now updated and provided feedback to through shared government governance and different work groups. So we have a pretty dynamic community um, created document that we're going to be able to use in a lot of different ways as we're making some um, updates and providing training for advising. So out of that document, um, the committee looked at what, what are some low hanging fruits that we need to address right away to be able to improve our advising practice. And that, and one that came from that is the way that we are providing information and advising to pre-admitted students. So these are potential students and their families that are just coming to Big Bend to check it out to see if this is the right college for them. They haven't gone through the admissions process. So that conversation is really following the document that Tammy just went through, the getting started guide that's talking about admissions application, paying for college, including financial aid and scholarships, the programs that we have across campus, options of degrees and certificates that students can complete, along with the career assessment, um, placement, testing, and then the next steps that would build up to NSR and Viking orientation. So what was currently happening um, is that 
students are meeting one or potential students are meeting one on one with advisors and a lot of that load comes over the summer when there's fewer advisors that are available on campus. So anyone that's looking at Big Bend is making a half an hour to 45 minute appointment with those advisors. Uh, and it got to the point, I know last summer, where we were booking out like two to three weeks out to be meeting with potential new students. Um, and that was offsetting the advising that we could provide to our current students as well that needed their questions answered right away. So we wanna look at some steps to alleviate um, that load, but more importantly, provide really high quality customer service to our community and to our potential students and their families uh, to standardize the messaging so that they're getting the same kind of information um, in any of the sessions. Something that we can provide online that they could refer back to or that they could view if they're working during that time or at home, just unavailable to come to campus. And we really wanted to be able to bridge between the outreach that's happening with Vanessa and Mike's work to connecting students from that back to campus. And then of course, free up some more advising appointments so that the advisors can be meeting with our current students on campus and giving them really good uh, customer service. So as a smaller group, uh, Zach Olson, Heidi Gephardt, Jen DeLeon, and I have developed a plan for small group sessions over the summer, we're calling them the Getting Started Information Sessions. And they're gonna be happening regularly over the summer. So we'll start advertising for these really soon. So I wanna share a little bit about that. This, they're gonna be regularly scheduled. They'll be on Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. and Thursday afternoons at 3 p.m. starting on June 4th through September 12th. The third Thursday of every month, we will also offer an evening session at six o'clock for our working families to come in. There will be facilitators across campus. And so an email went out yesterday to folks that are on campus over the summer, and there may be more that are joining that group soon to choose dates that they wanna facilitate. So you can choose to facilitate on your own or in a pair. The sessions will run about 30 minutes for a presentation, and then there'll be about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll be going on a campus tour where we were just gonna focus, first off on areas that are like open over the summer and happening, and areas that they need to know. So we'll be going through the 1400 building to admissions, financial aid, where the testing center is, where they need to pay at the business office, um, going through West, going to the library, et cetera, It'd be kind of a quick tour, knowing that they're getting the full tour when they come to Viking orientation. We will be providing training for the facilitators on May 30th and 31st. So you'll be looking for an invite to that to come and learn. Um, and we really wanna standardize the messaging. And so the sessions will be scripted. There's just gonna be a really short slideshow that would go along with it because what we want to use is the website that Tammy and her team are developing so that we can provide agency to students to be able to utilize the website and answer their own questions at home and be able to share that with their family members and others and know exactly the steps that they need to go through. The sessions are going to be held in the STEM Center during summer quarter when the STEM Center is open and we're still finalizing where the sessions will be located outside of those dates. We're looking at a group size of about 15 students and their family max per session. So it'll be a small enough group that we can provide them individual support and answer their questions within that time constraint and not make it too long. Um, but one really important aspect is that we're gonna also offer these all as a Zoom meeting viewing so that if folks are working or at home, they're able to participate in the sessions and able to type in their questions and have those answered by the facilitator in real time. We are also recording the first session and then earmarking when the different sections are discussed. So if someone comes to the session and then goes home and says, oh, what did she say about the scholarship application? They could go right to paying for college 
on the website and it would just go to that portion of the presentation so that they can review that again. Uh, we will be taking reservations through a real short online survey so that we know the number of students that are and their family members that are coming in to these sessions and that'll be on the website. Uh, and then we'll have some support from student admin services for call-ins or walk-ins to, to get them on the list. Um, and we're working out an email that would be sent out as a reminder and also pro be providing the link to the Zoom meetings. So you can look for more information on that coming. Um, it's a new way that we're gonna be able to deliver service and most importantly, be able to provide really high quality customer service and information to students when they want it and not make them wait and be able to provide better advising for our current students over the summer. Okay, I think next up, Heidi. All right, good morning. So I was just asked to talk about changes to uh, registration and orientation. So the good news is there's not gonna be any radical changes to, to new student registration or orientation this year because we're working really hard on getting the pre-admission um, information up and running and getting that going. Um, so NSR is not really gonna change. Um, the one thing that I would encourage you all to um, do though is participate in NSR as faculty. So when we get the numbers of students that are coming in NSR, we're purposely looking at what their intention is, what they indicate on their application so that we can let your departments know like, hey, we've got five people in business or we've got six people in welding or something like that. So that um, if there's an advisor that's available for those departments that they could come and maybe speak with those students um, in a smaller group session. So we really want you all to, to encourage you to look at those emails and if you're able to participate, um, please do because it's really helpful when we have faculty here to talk to students. That really helps them get up on the right foot. Um, with that said, there are probably going to be some changes to NSR and orientation. There's a lot of stuff in the works right now, so I'm kind of excited about that and believe it or not, I'm really excited about CTC link, which sounds kind of crazy, but I'm really excited about that. Um, so that brings me to the other um, thing that we've kind of been working on. So if it, you may or may not be familiar with the process of having students sign up for their student network accounts. So getting their Big Ben email set up um, and being able to log on to Canvas. So the way that we have that set up right now is a student comes to, they do their admissions application, they sign up for new student registration session. They come to new student registration session. We tell them a bunch of information. We get them their schedule. We send them out the door. We give them a little card that says in 48 hours, you can set up your student network ID. And then they're supposed to go into the system and do that themselves. Um, so that's been a little bit of a barrier because sometimes it's difficult for students to figure that out. However, when they come early, in the, early enough in the process, you know, we've been able to catch them at our Viking orientation and they can go and get help. BBT is always there to help them. So it's been really awesome and they can help them get those network IDs set up. Where it's really a, uh, where it's really a problem is when we have students that are registering. Because right at this point, we allow students to register through the first week of classes and we've had students get permission to register into the second week of classes. That's a problem, right? We all know this as faculty because students are already behind on the first day if they're not already enrolled in your class. And then if they don't have their student network ID set up because they've got to wait two days after they register to be able to do that, they can't get into Canvas to see what the content is for your class. And now they're even further behind. So this, um, so what we've, what we've kind of figured out as a way to sort of trick the system a little bit, we're still kind of working on it so it's not like perfect. But what we found is that we might be able to assign students as they um, complete their mission process with a kind of like a dummy class. So it's not a dummy class, but like we can, we can register them in a class that's non-credit bearing, so they're not gonna be charged for it, but the, it triggers the process that allows them to set up their student network ID. So that's one of the things that we've been working on. It looks like this is gonna work and we may be able to actually implement that at NSR over the summer. We may be able to actually have students sign up for their, get their student network ID when they come to NSR. So that's one thing we're looking at, but we haven't actually got all the details um, hammered out on that one. The other um, thing that we're looking at with that is possibly trying to pilot an online new student orientation, uh, new student registration session for um, 
right now looking at like our out of state students. So a lot in, in the summer, we get, we register a lot of athletes over the phone because they're out of state and they're not going to come all the way to Moses Lake to register for classes. So we're doing a lot of sessions over the phone. Those sessions take a long time, can take anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. And you're just talking to students over the phone about Big Bend. It's not really probably the best way for people to learn about the college because they're going to forget probably 90% of what you told them over the phone. Um, so we're going to, tr we're trying to put together an online um, orientation that we could assign those as students to. If, and if we're able to set up their student network IDs once they complete admissions, we're able to assign them to a Canvas class. So then we can track to make sure that they've completed it. And then they can talk to an advisor about classes. And I think that'll actually save us some time over the summer. And I think it'll be a better service to students. And we're also considering um, looking at that for our out-of-state um, aviation students as well, because aviation is another program where we get a lot of students that are coming from out-of-state to the area. So that's something we're trying to get in place. I'm crossing my fingers that we can get it put together before the end of the quarter. But um, that's where we're, what we're looking at with um, that process. So I just want to update you all on that. And next, I think, Rafael, are you talking about... Who's next? I don't have the updated schedule, so <laughs> I have the old agenda. Sorry. Uh, it's advising day. Advising day. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Between the two of us. Lindsay Gross, everyone. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, an advising day that we're piloting this quarter. So um, as part of all of the changes with the advising structure, we in math and science and then also the social sciences are going to get together next Friday, the 10th, from 11 to 2 over in the 1200 building. And we're inviting all of our individual advisees for our different faculty um, to come in. And there's three one-hour sessions. So at 11, 12, and 1, Ann Ganazi and maybe Rafa um, are going to be over there helping us with some general announcements and general information. And then we're all going to be available for our advisees in computer labs to be able to sit down with them and just try to hammer out some of the advising that happens during weeks six through eight normally. So what we're trying to do is alleviate our own advising loads during that time when the students have a hard time finding us because we're in class all day or labs all day. So we're trying to just see what happens. We're a bunch of scientists after all. So we're just experimenting to see how it goes. And, um, and we'll kind of report back, I think on how it um, all plays out. It's probably not gonna be huge in terms of numbers this first time through, but if it works out well, then maybe this could be something that we utilize um, even during a normal uh, week. Maybe we have a day designated, like on a Monday or a Tuesday that we could all do advising and see what that looks like in the future. That's the idea anyway. So that's um, what I was asked to talk about. Are there any questions on that? Yeah, Preston. That's the idea. Yeah, and we're going to emphasize, right, exactly. I mean, they may have to follow up still, but the idea is that especially for the under 30, they could get their pin, they could be getting their classes figured out for both summer and fall for this time through, and then they wouldn't have to come back in that time when everything's kind of crazy. That's the hope anyway. Are there other questions? If you guys have any thoughts or um, are interested in being a part of it, then don't hesitate to reach out, or if you have feelings on it, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love to hear all about them. Um, and I'm just the celebrity guest star, so I don't know who's coming next. Oh, Rafa. I am, the, I believe, the last thing between you, a few questions and a break, so I'll try to keep this brief. Um, here we go. It's one of these. Ah, there you go. <clears throat> So I'm hoping um, that most of you did your homework and saw the email and went to the portal and read those documents, right? Totally. All right. So I wanted to follow up on the email that I had sent out regarding advising software, um, uh, essentially kind of a snapshot about it and also next steps and um, an opportunity for you to provide some input uh, and where we are with all of this. Um, and this is almost like a super condensed version of what came in your email. Uh, so what it does, so we are currently uh, looking at two bids, one from Civitas Learning and another one from Hobson Starfish. Uh, there's a couple of things that they both do. Um, they both are going to integrate with things that already exist, uh, SMS and then moving forward, CTC link. Um, 
as well as tying into our Outlook system. Uh, this is something that they weren't able to do a couple of years ago, which is new to both software applications. And so we aren't necessarily um, adopting a one-off item. Uh, we've done that in the past with things like uh, ADP or academic early warning or um, there's been a number of things that have been homegrown. This is something that uh, has a team behind them and it's not something that if someone were to leave it were to fall apart, right? Uh, the other is it's gonna support case management. So thinking about not just what we do with students in those advising sessions, but what we do for onboarding them. Um, we have the capacity for having a single space for sharing notes, but also having notes that are private. Um, so uh, counseling faculty will have the ability to make those uh, counseling session notes private, uh, only accessible to them, uh, or to be able to make uh, academic advising notes public for anyone who accesses that student profile to be able to see that information. Um, unlike say ADP where you have to go and ask for credentials and it has limited information, um, this would actually just be accessible to everyone. Uh, going back to the integrate, start of the first bullet, integrate into existing sources, it has single user sign on. So once you log into Canvas, you're already in those software applications. It's just another item on the left-hand column. So you don't have to go somewhere else to use this. All of this is in the same place. Um, thinking about the work that we're doing around comprehensive student supports and like, well, who do I send the person or a student to if, or uh, what if they're in, in West or what if they're in TRIO? Well, we can tie more than one person to a single student. So that when, you're, when life happens to your student outside of things in the classroom and their academic planning, you can do that handoff electronically and there's a workflow that happens as part of that. Um, so if you are that person that likes to walk that student across campus or across the building to do that, fabulous. Uh, if you are a quarter mile away from that person or half mile across campus, uh, you can do that digitally and still then be able to follow up on whether or not that referral was completed. Uh, we can create workflows for students all the way from when we get them in the system when they first apply all the way to when we complete them. So whether it's an onboarding workflow, uh, paying, their, paying their, uh, their $30 during their placement, applying for graduation, going in for mandatory advising, we can create those and make them automated for students to start giving them those nudges. Uh, and we give them those nudges in a manner that they prefer. So just like Canvas, when you set up how you wanna be communicated with, whether it's a text message or whether it's your personal email or your Big Ben email or all of them, uh, students would be able to set up those preferences so that we know they're actually receiving the information that we are transmitting to them. Uh, the other was uh, storage of that information. So things like um, currently we use ADP for notes, but then if you wanted to actually access a student's ed plan, uh, we would hope that it would be in a shared space. They are not. They're typically on somebody's hard drive or their H drive. And if that crashes or that person isn't there, then that work has to be recreated all over again. Uh, that's only on the advising side. We can use that uh, as well on the student administrative support services side. Uh, so thinking about uh, satisfactory academic plans um, uh, or any other kind of documentation for students, we can keep it all in one place. Um, we would bring back actually using early warning again in the same place. So you're able to, if you're an active Canvas user, you can see your students in your classes and then you can just pick another tab and look at your advisees. <clears throat> and any notifications tied to either of those. Uh, and so rather than the old academic early warning system, this would be uh, looking at your classes and your students. And in that instance, already in Canvas, where you might already be doing grading or attendance or announcements, you can report a student for any number of reasons. Um, and then that would then go out and create a workflow for an intervention. So all of that, one place. And one of the big questions I've been getting was, well, how are we paying for all of this, right? Um, and how are we going to pay for it after I'm done paying for it? And so as part of uh, the Transforming STEM Pathways grant, over the last couple of years, we've compounded some savings. In the first year, there's some savings because of salary. It takes a while for the program to get fully staffed. There were some savings there. got rolled over into the second year and then ultimately rolled over into this third year. Uh, last year, Microsoft uh, was very generous in donating, donating tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And then Stetner Electric donated their uh, services to actually put in the infrastructure to install it. And then we had then savings in that aspect too. Um, and so because of that compounded savings, I reached out to uh, essentially executive team 
Um, so we had a president, a couple of vice presidents, deans, the foundation, and we're like, hey, how could we best use some of the savings uh, in a way that meets my grant objectives, but also then can meet needs at the college. And so it took roughly about seven years, three jobs and a promotion for the software to finally make its way into a, an actual reality. Uh, and so I, I've been at Big Ben since actually the only administrator, dean level or higher that's been here longer than I have in their role is um, uh, Valerie. So I've been here roughly a little bit longer than the president, the vice presidents, and every dean in their respective role. So since I've been here in 2012, this is something that I've seen that, hey, it wouldn't be awesome if we could do all of this in one place, right, um, and be able to communicate with students in a way that actually works for them. And so in looking at salary and all of those savings, those compounded savings, I reached out to our program officer and was like, hey, you know, I kind of want to probe a little feeler. How would you feel about maybe exploring like, you know, software? And I was first trying to gauge just whether or not it'd be plausible. And he hit me with all the technical questions, which then basically became a formal request. And he's like, yeah, run with it. Uh, and so we got approval from our Department of Education and Program Officer uh, to actually use 170,000 of that carry forward uh, savings uh, on software. I was looking at three years, uh, but after a little bit of haggling and getting uh, these two software companies to compete against each other, I have proposals from both, one for four years, one for five. Um, and so uh, the grant itself only has about two and a half years left over. And so this would give the college some sustainability um, after the grant has ended. And looking at funding it after that runs out, there's two or a combination of those two. One is um, increased FTE because of what we're maintaining. Our pipeline isn't going to get that much bigger. Looking at 10 years worth of enrollment data, we've never really broken 2000 FTE. It's somewhere between, you know, 1950 and 1990, but it's never broken 2000. We're not going to overnight or over the next five years grow our FTE to like, you know, 2500. Um, the bodies just aren't physically here, right? However, we can maintain more of those students and complete more of those students and the software should give us the ability to do that because we're supporting students uh, and tracking them along the way. Now that would then provide us an additional funding throughout the time those students are here. And that's one way to be able to fund it. The other is that worst case scenario is if we, even if we pass that cost on to the student, to the student technology fee, again, not taking from institutional funding that already, that already goes to your departments, uh, but actually passing the cost on to students or the tech fee would be roughly about five bucks a quarter per student. And so those are a couple of ways that we're looking at for actually funding it four to five years from now. Okay. Um, a couple of other things that I was considering and looking at this was um, also the fact that we would get roughly about two years of it on SMS and then we would get roughly about two years of it on CPC link. And so we'd know whether or not it's worth its weight and retention and completion um, after the actual funding from the grant runs out. So a few next steps. Um, if you want to dive into the uh, into the nuts and bolts of it. The proposals are there from both Civitas and from Starfish. Um, uh, there was a demo a couple years ago from Starfish and then a demo in the fall, winter, sometime this school year, uh, from both. Um, most folks that were in that, so there was uh, some folks from Student Administrative Support Services, uh, deans, some directors, some advisors, um, the leaning is towards Starfish for a number of reasons. One, the end user experience seems a little bit more intuitive. Um, at the moment, uh, Starfish has 10 other community and technical colleges in the state. Um, and when I first seen them a couple of years ago, they only had like seven or eight, so they're growing. Civitas is losing schools. They've got one, I believe, left over. It's uh, Tacoma Community College. Uh, but they're also on PeopleSoft, on CPC Link, and so it wouldn't be the same thing. And it's also not the same product. And so as much as we like to be innovative, a new product kind of scares me uh, when there's already a proven standard that's working at roughly a third of our other community and technical colleges with raving reports. And so um, innovation is great, but you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and so there's something out there that works and works very well. Um, their responsiveness also in like this bidding process has been much quicker. Uh, and more comprehensive. So, um, 
once we actually then, so we've got roughly 10 days. Um, I haven't, the bids themselves are good through the end of the month. I'm supposed to have something locked in uh, by the end of the month to be compliant with my carry forward spending plan. I'd like to actually lock in a vendor roughly in about the next 10 days so we can get moving forward. Uh, and so that we can start integration planning. So that would be working with BBT. In fact, uh, we've already had some meetings and they've had some meetings with uh, one of the vendors to see about the nuts and bolts of integrating it into our, into our system. Uh, identifying a rollout schedule. There's a lot of bells and whistles with this. It's not a full steam ahead, everything launches in the fall. It's, hey, what are those low hanging fruit that we could use? Maybe it's, hey, we wanna start with, um, uh, tying it to Outlook so that you can schedule your advising appointments with your students um, through their uh, through the app itself so that they can schedule a time that works with you based on the office hours that you put out there for them. Uh, we could do something like uh, the academic early warning and let that go. Uh, and then maybe something in the student services side that allows them to you know streamline the onboarding a little bit before we start going full throttle with everything that they have. Uh, they have predictive analytics. We could look at, you know, what those measures are further down the road and how we tie those into ed planning. Um, once we decide what it is we're going to roll out, we're going to need folks to provide their input and support for actually developing those campaigns and those processes and those timelines for students. Uh, and so that'll be work that's mostly going to happen over the summer. And so uh, if you're going to be here, uh, awesome. If you'd like to be here, please join us. Uh, and then uh, with those things that we are deciding to launch out on an ongoing schedule is being able to then develop the training in a timely manner so that as it gets rolled out, you're not like, well, what do I do with that? And you're actually capable and competent in how to use it. Um, and so uh, the goal is to have at least some of those key features launched out by fall. So how you can help. Uh, so going back to if you're thinking like on the student services side, what those workflows may be like, uh, what warnings and notifications could look like, um, what the inputs could be. So whatever academic early warning was that you loved about it, we can redo that. Whatever you hated about it, we can not do that. Uh, and so whatever it is that we want to report students for um, and what we want those inputs to be. So if we're deciding, hey, we want some of them to be automated and we want some of them to be manual. Uh, some of it can be based on attendance. Some of, some of it can be based on grades. Uh, some of it can be based on a single assignment. And so that can be very individualized based on your own class, um, or we can do it as a whole. One of the things you can do, if, even if you don't want to participate in all that other rollout stuff, is just use Canvas uh, and use it regularly. Uh, it doesn't have to be for everything. Uh, I know for some of your classes, Canvas just may not work for doing uh, maybe the way you deliver your class, but it may be a way for you to at least take attendance. So if we know a student isn't showing up, and they may not catch your eye, but you're taking attendance, well, the system will catch it for you and then we can reach out to that student. Um, so again, depending on your comfort level with Canvas, right, we can start with something as basic as just attendance and then maybe weeks two, four, and seven, uh, you could have grades be current and then that could be something that triggers those automatic uh, notifications for students as well. Uh, the other is share this uh, with your students. Again, we'll be working on messaging to be able to get this out to students and to you as well. And just, you know, sharing that with your students uh, that this is going to be the new uh, mode by which we communicate with them uh, or just another mode by which we will communicate with them. Uh, you could start to use that scheduling tool, maybe make your life a little bit easier. Um, you have the ability with the software to give kudos to your students. So it's not just, hey, you're being, you know, here's a warning, here's a notification, here's a concern. It's like, hey, I noticed you pulled a 2.5 on this uh, X test or assignment, you know, congrats, that's really important, right? You can do that as part of this software as well. Um, if you have things that you're doing routinely that you wish you could just automate, right? Um, there might be an opportunity for you to create your own workflow um, or success plan for your students as part of this. So it doesn't have to be for all students, it could be for your advisees. Um, and the other, as I had mentioned before, it doesn't have to be all of it. Uh, so I'm kind of an 80s kid, so enjoy the Kool-Aid. Uh, but in the sense, it's, it's a cool aid. It's a cool tool that you can use to hopefully make your life easier. My goal in looking at the software wasn't to like give you more work. It was of those things you have to do all the time. How could we make your life a little easier? I'm waiting for the guy to just blast through the back right now. Like, it's not gonna happen, right? And so you don't have to feel like you're drowning in the use of the software. Um, but if you could use it in any capacity or find some use for it, then just move forward with those little tidbits that could make your life easier. 
Um, if it's just a scheduling, hey, awesome, makes your life easier in scheduling. If it's the academic early warning, fabulous, let us get, give us an opportunity to intervene and support those students. Okay. All right, so moving forward, um, with the software at least, uh, if you have questions about that now, you're welcome. If you need time to process um, and come up with something uh, a little more in depth, you can reach out to me later. You can pop into my office, we can do lunch, you can send me an email. Uh, whatever works for you, um, but hopefully soon so that I can account for that information as I move forward um, with the folks um, uh, that are going to be, that, well, with everyone, uh, in making the decision with who we're going to go with. As I said, we're kind of leaning towards Starfish, um, but if there's uh, concerns, I'd like to hear them. So as we move forward with whatever vendor we do pick, um, that we make sure that those concerns are addressed uh, before we start implementation. So, questions about the software or questions about anything you've heard in the last hour? Um, So I'll make a comment and then uh, Kathleen, uh, I think has something to say. So one of the, th from where I'm sitting, um, when we look at some of the feedback from students from the presentation that uh, the advisors gave, or the counselors gave, and some of the feedback that I've, that I've received, uh, either directly or indirectly, um, there's concerns about students um, being able to connect with their faculty. We have some inequities in advising loads. We have, I've heard a lot of concern about, you know, weeks, what, six through nine. I have a hard time as a faculty member being able to manage the work that I have because I have so many advisees coming. I don't have time to prep and grading and so forth. And so my hope is that with some of these things that we're trying to do, we're not adding to the pile, but we're trying to better organize work in a way that can simplify and make your life easier. Um, Kathleen? I would just add that, you know, referencing the, the negotiated agreement, advising is part of the faculty duties. And so how can we better do this in a way that makes your work easier? Uh, I think Bryce has somewhat said oh. my viewpoint as well. I, um, I don't think, I, I don't see the intent is to try to uh, figure out how to uh, pile more and more and more on uh, on my faculty. I don't see that at all. I'm I'm trying to um, figure out ways with other work groups and other things to try to even out the the challenges that associate with meeting the needs of our students. And our students have changed. 
over time. And we need to meet the needs of the students where they are. We need to, we need to be student ready. And sometimes that means that the way we do our work uh, as faculty changes over time. And so the intent is, the intent is not to add more to your plate, but it is recognizing that our students need, need more from us. And so how can we effectively apply that? So uh, Rafa's presentation about starfish or civitas is definitely a tool to try to help us um, meet the needs of our students in more purposeful ways. Um, the idea of an advising day that some faculty have done, that, that idea came originally from faculty that heard about it at other colleges. That how am I going to get my advising done and other places are doing this. I don't think that's, an, that's not something that I am open to all solutions for how, uh, how faculty can meet their needs of students and how we can help faculty not feel overloaded with the responsibilities they have. Steve. I understand that. I do understand that. And I think that's where our conversations continue is to, uh, if we're being student centered and we're trying to look at how we can meet the needs of our students, we don't, there's no easy answers or else we would have had them, uh, had them solved a long time ago. And so we're continuing with conversations. We're continuing to try to um, investigate what works and what doesn't. The advising day model is not something that um, faculty that are interested are doing that to try something new. Does that mean we want to see that be prescriptive for everyone? I think the intent was to try it and see what happens with that. It's the experiment, experimenting, like Lindsay had said. So sometimes we're going to find solutions by just trying and trying and trying the new things. As a scientist, I learned that most of my work as a scientist was trying and trying and trying. And then something that I thought worked, repeating it again and again and again um, to see if I got data. And in the same way, we're doing that here. We're trying to move forward in a purposeful way. Will there be things that, um, will there be hiccups or things that have unexpected consequences? There always are. Will we have to make changes down the road and shift and adjust? But hopefully, we're in, we keep our eye on, eye on supporting our students to be successful. We're committed to student success and we're committed to a growth mindset that we're, we're going to work to improve and we're going to work to change what we're doing to better need, meet our needs, but also with the realm that we're meeting the students' needs. And I don't have the complete answers for that. Uh, but I can truly tell you, I, my intent is not to pile more and more and more on faculty.
thank you for the questions and for your comments, Kathleen. We are uh, out of time, unfortunately. We've got a, a presenter for our next session has come in. So before we leave, if I just want to make one comment. The presentations, the information for the presentations, we'll have that in a folder on the portal. I know, if, especially from the back, some of the presentations, you can read all the text. So if you want to go back and take a look at the presentations, read through them, we'll have those available on the portal. We'll send out a link with that. So can we have a round of applause for all the people that are presenting? We've had a great job. We really do have some outstanding work going on here. Let's break and let's come together uh, right after 10 o'clock. Thanks. All right, so we'll try to move along here because Bryce and I are between you and food and um, not a good place to be. I want to talk a little bit about uh, enrollment management considerations or strategies. Uh, there is some confusion. Perhaps we haven't given complete information. And uh, so we want to make sure that people have a more comprehensive understanding. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, first of all, I need to set the need. <clears throat> this pie represents our state allocation of full-time equivalent students for 20, the last year, 2017, 2018 academic year. And you can see that for those of you that are new to the Washington system, each year community and technical colleges, each college gets a target. And the idea is that if you meet your target, you get your allocation. If you don't meet your target, then your allocation is reduced. And so it gets real complicated and I don't want to get down into the weeds too much, but we have a three year rolling average. And so it does take time for losses in enrollment to catch up to us. For 2017-18, we had a shortfall of 198 FTE. That's 11% of our state allocation budget. If the impact of that loss were immediate, we would lose about $1.1 million. But fortunately, it's not immediate. There's this three-year average. Now, unfortunately, we've been losing enrollment over the past several years. We've been fortunate in that two things are at work. One is Linda Schoonmaker is very conservative fiscally. And so we haven't gotten out there like some colleges. Some colleges, it's scary what they're doing because it's not sustainable. The other thing that's working in our favor, why the three-year rolling average isn't affecting us negatively, is that the whole system is down. And so the colleges were, were all suffering losses in enrollment. At uh, last Friday, a week ago, we had a WAC meeting down in uh, Columbia Basin College and the leader of our group asked the presidents there for a show of hands. How many of you are laying off employees and closing programs. A third of the college presidents are doing that right now. I don't want to be that in that group. I want us to continue to thrive and later I, I will explain exactly why that's so important. 
because um, there is a broader strategic reason for that. So one of the things that we have to struggle with as community and technical colleges is that our enrollments go down when employment goes up. People want to work rather than come to school. It's a tricky inverse relationship that we have mixed feelings about because we do want our local economy to be in good shape. We want people to have, you know, living jo uh, wage jobs and things like that. But with that shift, it does mean that there are challenges for the college. So the enrollment management strategies that we're considering include strategies that defy the effects of the local economy. And one of those is athletics. Athletes don't care about the economy. They care about competing. And so they will come to a college that they ordinarily wouldn't have thought of coming to because there's an opportunity to play. In 2017-18, we had about 100 athletes who created or produced 90 full-time equivalents, about 5% of our um, state allocation. If we didn't have athletics and we lost that 5%, we would have lost about a little over $500,000. If we take $500,000 out of our budget, it's going to affect more than our ability to travel or buy paper clips because 85% of our budget is personnel. So I'm just setting the scene for you that um, why we're focusing on athletics, if you'd go to the next. Um, we can't maintain the status quo because eventually it's going to catch up with us. We've got to grow enrollments. We've got to be in a growth mode. If we contract, if we reduce programs like athletics, then we won't, um, we won't be able to support programs like our transfer. Um, programs. Um, in 2017-18, of the 100 student athletes that we had at Big Ben, <clears throat> 95 were in transfer programs. Only five were in programs like aviation, computer science, IST, nursing, and welding. So athletes really do support our academic programs. And then because of our success with the President's Cup, we know that student athletes have better success rates than the average student at Big Ben. There's all sorts of positives with this. But my approach is that we want to do things that are going to support our college, our funding, so that we don't have to get into the situation that so many other presidents are getting into, which is closing programs and laying off employees. So those are, I think, you know, why it's worth the money, and I think it benefits the college. Yeah, go to the next slide. So I think I've covered all that. Um, the way we're doing athletics, we're also trying to use um, the revenues that they generate so that we don't take it from any other part of the college. And those revenues then um, can provide for the budget for athletics as well as uh, making capital improvements. Brian?
while while it's true that using the tuition um, revenues that student athletes bring in to help support the program that doesn't um, well it's still it's additional you know it's kind of applying for the cost but it doesn't require taking money from other parts of the college but the other thing is that the FTEs that those students generate then preserve that pie so we're Right, we're trying to reduce the the wedge, that 11% shortfall, so that we don't get hit with um, decrease in state allocation funding because we didn't make, make our target. We're trying to stay as close to that target as possible. Then there's other ways that they bring in funding because many of them, uh, Last year, 62% of them were from out of state. 25% uh, of them were from Washington, but out of district. So many of them stay in our residence halls. So there's revenues to help support that operation. They eat in the cafeteria because they're on campus residents. So you get that, you know, those, those downstream benefits, if you will from uh, student athletes that you might not get from from commuter students so it's and i know it's really more complicated i could turn the microphone over to linda and she could really go into more depth but i don't think that's what you need right now but certainly i'm willing to um, provide more information and in more detail we'll be doing that with the trustees too at an upcoming board meeting uh, let's see. And then capital improvements. A lot of the work that's being done in that area is, um, well, I know Mark's been working with the Booster Club and um, to generate fundraising to support athletics and, and do capital improvements through uh, private donations. So um, at our very first, uh, banquet uh, auction fundraiser we raised nearly thirty seven thousand dollars that night so that's something that we've never tapped into much like our foundation has not we haven't developed an alumni association we're in the process of doing that but we're missing out on really long-term relationships we've made a profound impact on the lives of people whether they're student athletes or regular students and if we can reconnect with our alum and cultivate those relationships they're successful people now business people and leaders in their communities and they're more affluent and if we ask they're going to support us because they do feel something special uh, toward Big Ben, um, working with Michael and a group in the community to see about doing fundraising to renovate Wallenstein because there are people who have gone through Big Ben, been touched by the music program, um, and they want, they want to help support Big Ben and they're willing to do it privately. And uh, so that's kind of the the whole strategy and approach there for for athletics so i'm going to turn it over to bryce and he's going to talk about um, another enrollment strategy process and that is uh, the baccalaureate degree in applied science and why this would be another way of um, helping the college with enrollments and um, defying the effects, the negative effects of a successful economy. So Bryce. So I wanna share a few other things in regards to athletics. Um, 
so we have a budget allocation problem. It's not an athletics problem. I mean, we, we have an FTE issue and we have a budget allocation issue. Um, back in, I think it was around 2012, when the state legislature said, you cannot use your state allocation funds to support athletics, that, which we had been doing at that time, um, we, we had an issue. We, if we had state funds, which that pie, that FTE generation results in X amount of money that the, that the college receives. Okay, the college is using those funds and ASB funds to support athletics. You take away the allocation funds, your budget, your expenses are, great, are greater than just what you're getting from ASB, you have a budget shortfall, okay? And it's not, doesn't have anything to do with how athletics is operating and whether they're being fiscally responsible. It's that you don't have the funds available to, to athletics, okay? That they previously had. So at that time, the college made a decision to say, athletics has built up a whole bunch of reserves funds, use those reserve funds until they run out. Other colleges in the state said, okay, rather than using state allocation funds, which we're now prohibited from using, we'll just use tuition funds, which we are legally allowed to use. So other colleges made that switch. You look at any other athletic program, college athletic program, the 34, not every community technical college in the state has athletics, but those that do, they're supporting them with tuition dollars and ASB funds. Big Ben didn't go that route. And so now we're at a point where this year, the reserve funds are gone. The, we've been living off of them every year for the past, well, since 2012. They're gone now. So now, what do we do? If we cut athletics, and it's either you either cut or you put more money into it, right? You cut or you grow. We can't afford to cut athletics because of the FTE loss. And if we just said, okay, we're gonna slap off, cut off a bunch of uh, tuition money and stick it into athletics, where's that money gonna come from? It's gonna come from all your budgets. And so we don't want to, we wanna protect and preserve the budgets that departments have, cause no harm to folks, we can't afford to lose the FTE, so what do we do? So we adopted a growth strategy in launching wrestling and then taking a, not even all of it, but a portion of the tuition from the wrestlers, because these are students we wouldn't have ever had otherwise. So these students we wouldn't otherwise had, we take a percentage of their tuition and we're putting that into the athletic department budget. So this is a way in which we're trying to reallocate those funds in a way that preserves and protects the budgets of all the rest of you. And at the same time, it's generating new FDE to fill in this hole so that we don't have an institutional shortfall and have to lay people off. Okay, is that making sense? So, and why, why in the world wrestling? Well, there's a lot of local support. The overhead was really low. We were able to keep the travel local within the region. We didn't give out any scholarships, so the scholarships is a big cost for the sports. And we had low insurance costs. <coughs> there is, an, and it had the potential to have large rosters. Every, Ross, every new student there is more tuition dollars, more FTE, right? So it wasn't that, if we offer, if we start a team that you got a roster of 10 students, those 10 students, they generate some FTE and some tuition. But when you do something like wrestling, where we can get 60 or 60 plus students, that's a lot of FTE and it's a lot of tuition. And so wrestling has the potential to generate enough tuition to cover all of its operating expenses and still have money to go back into the athletic department budget to cover those, the, the budget shortfall, okay? And to the question that Ryan asked, we only took a percentage of tuition, even if we took all the tuition from, from all those student, all those wrestling athletes, 
If we took 100% of their tuition and dumped it into athletics, is there still value to the college? Yes, there is because we're generating FTE. This FTE preservation, I can't emphasize that enough. That's huge. That's our base budget that's paying for all of our salaries except for the folks that are on grants, right? We, we have to preserve this to be able to preserve our base budget. So even if tuition wasn't even in the picture, getting those guaranteed FTEs helps keep us sound. The last thing I would say relative to why athletes versus something else is student athletes have to be full time to compete. And so it gets you, it takes fewer bodies to get to a full FTE than of non-athletes. Because when you look at, when you look at our percentage of full time versus part time students, we, we have a close to 4,000 students per year. And just under 2,000 FTE, that means that two students on average makes one FTE because we have so many that are attending part time. With a student athlete, you have a fewer number of students with a you have a higher FTE ratio per student. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, thank you. Hope, hopefully, it's something. Yes. Well, that's the thing. In order to compete in the sport, they have to be full-time student. Okay. We have, we have locally made a decision that we're requiring that. There have been a few, ex there have been some one-offs, exceptions. But by and large, they've got to be full-time. And so when you, when you look here, there are about 100 student athletes in 17, 18, and that produced 90 FTEs. The reason why it's not 100 FTEs, by and large, is because you'd have some students like uh, Preston, who'll have, he'll have some of these uh, women's basketball players who finish their degree by the end of winter and then they don't come back spring. Or there'll be a student that's recruited mid-year or something like that. And so it has more to do with people not being here for the full year than being part-time as a student. Yeah. So what about our athletes that come in for their season and then they're gone? We do have some of that. Okay. So when we look at the at the uh, strategy with athletics, the idea is to build on the academic success. If we had, I wouldn't be up here talking to you about this if we had an athletic program where the student athletes did poorly academically. I couldn't support that because the ha academics has to be number one before the, uh, before the athletics. Our student athletes have a higher retention rate, higher GPA, and a higher completion rate than the average of the transfer students, because most of them are transfer students. And the transfer average is higher, um, not always on completion than, than workforce, but they, our transfer students have, higher, have pretty high rates, okay? And so we're building on that. We're pushing for full rosters. And it's not just full rosters. We, we want, if you can, if you can ha have a full roster of 15 students, well, by golly, let's recruit 15 students. Let's not recruit 10. So have a full roster. But then the other part of that is got to, we want the coaches to retain the full roster. And so what that might mean is, if you have a roster of 15 students, you're recruiting 20 or 17 or 18 because some of them aren't gonna make it through the full year because we want to see a full roster at the end of the year, not just in the season that you're competing, okay? We have the growth of a team and I explained that idea with the, with the wrestling. Additional fundraising, as uh, Dr. Lee's talked on that, and then that, that tuition allocation. The only, the only way that this will work for us is if a new sport is added that pays for itself with fundraising and FTE and tuition, or not FTE, but tuition revenue, it pays for itself, pays for its operating expenses, or 
So we break even on the tuition, but we're generating new FTE, or we have a sport that generates more tuition than the operating cost. So it pays for itself, but also adds to the bottom line for the athletics department. From the sports we've looked at, there's only two that we've have, and we haven't analyzed every single sport option, right? But the two that can do that um, are wrestling and track, if we could use the high school track facilities. If we had to put it on our own facility, it would never pay for itself. But track, there's hardly any scholarships and you can recruit up to 100 students, right? So it can pay for itself and generate more money. We're looking at eSports, we haven't done an analysis on that. But the idea is we have to, we have to be generating some more additional money. And then allocating money just from those students so it preserves the budget for the rest of you. Any other comments on, questions on that? And yeah, sorry for those of you on the budget review task force, that wasn't explained very well in the, in the request. But again, I, I, I just wanna say again, the value to the college, the greatest value is that FTE preservation. So even if you gave 100% of the tuition from those student athletes to athletics, there's still a value to the college in the FTE preservation because we need that. Go ahead, Jim. The, the recruiting cost? So there's a, there's a team budget. And so the, and recruitment is a part of that. And so the team gets, here's the reality of what the coaches get told. Me. And Preston, you tell me if I'm wrong here. But it's basically, here's your budget. And you're figuring out your cost within that. And if it costs you more to do recruitment, then you do fundraise to make that up the difference, whether it's recruitment or whether it's, whether it's tennis shoes or, or uniforms or, what, or travel, whatever. If your costs are going to be greater than that, you've got to fundraise to make up the difference. Is that? Yeah, that's true. Um, or we choose not to get uh, practice gear. Or we choose to get from Walmart instead of from Nike. And then we go and use that money to recruit. Or we don't travel. We do it on the internet by the phone. So we, we're not spending tens of twenty thousand dollars spend $500,000. Our, our team budgets are some of the lowest in the state. They're, they're pretty minuscule. So, that, so in addition to this, all the teams have to do fundraising. Any other questions on that? Okay. Um, we talked about, we talked about most of these. The one thing I want to point out, when you talk about the benefit, does, do student athletes really benefit non-athletes? Is there a benefit to non-athletes for having an athletic program? And, you know, you can argue this a variety of different ways, but there's a couple things I'd point out. One is, if we're not, there'd be no, there'd be no emotion or care about the Vikings if we didn't have a sports team, right? Your mascot's kind of meaningless if you don't have an athletics team. But just from a dollars and cents perspective, when you look at 2017-18, the, the, uh, the value of those 100 student athletes that we, that we had, they, uh, they paid, they brought in enough revenue to the college to fund six full-time faculty, 53 classes taught by full-time faculty, or 131 classes taught by associate faculty, over $40,000 in SNA fee revenue, which is more than all the clubs combined, all the money that they requested combined. The fee revenue from our student athletes was greater than that. And enough of the needy student financial aid to nearly fund three full-time students for a year. Um, so th there's a direct financial benefit as well. The more student athletes, the more SNA fees and so forth. So not to beat that horse, but just to give a little bit of perspective. 
Um, relative to the BAS. Um, and the BAS, the Bachelor of Applied Science, is another enrollment management strategy that uh, we're looking at. We're looking at Title V grant as a major fund source to, to pay for the development of the degree. But a couple thoughts behind that. I've had, heard some folks say, well, why in the heck would we think about that? When we look at a, at a Bachelor's of Applied Science, we looked at we wanted to find out from employers, was there a need? And we did an employer survey this winter. I was frankly shocked by some of the results there. We had well over, we had 150 some odd employers respond to the survey. We're looking at a management degree. There are well over 100 openings right now just from the people who respond to that survey. And that survey was confined to our service district. We weren't looking at Eastern <laughs> Washington. We we're looking at just our service district. And over the next few years, a projection of over 300 openings. And employers talked about how difficult it was to find locally grown talent and retain local, retain talent. Recruit someone in that has the degree, the credentials, and then they, they take off again. And so there's a, there was a tremendous amount of interest on the part of the of employers for a bachelor's degree. And why management? So in, in the data that we looked at, there was one data, one uh, source of data that was based off of ONET job postings in the region. And I we did a search through there to look at bachelor's prepared positions, and what were those the most job postings in the area for bachelor's prepared positions. And there were three, three that where there's a, a whole lot. I mean, there's a few, there are a lot of categories where there's a few here, a few there, but not enough that you could build an academic program around it. The three where there's a whole lot of postings was nursing, education and management. Okay. Probably no, no surprise. Um, nursing and education are two that have external credentialing bodies. They're quite complex, um, difficult to manage. There are several colleges around the state that are doing uh, BASs in education. And I've, and of the, as I've talked to different representatives of colleges, vice presidents, I have yet to hear one who said, yeah, this is a slam dunk. It's great, it's worth it, per working perfectly. They're, they're struggling with it. And frankly, if we're gonna, if we're gonna consider a BAS, nursing or um, teacher ed seems like it's much more complex and difficult than I think we'd be ready to try right out the gate. The other thing is we're a small school. We have a few graduates in a bunch of different areas. For us to have a sustainable pro bachelor's degree program where you have multiple students coming in every year, you have to have something that's broad enough that you can have graduates from any one of our programs go into it. With nursing, the only students who can apply are those who come for, through our nursing program. And if it's teacher ed, it's not quite as narrow, but it's still rather narrow. With a management degree, any graduate from any of our programs could go into a management degree. And so, hence, we're looking at that. When we look at, Terry talked about the economy, when we, when we think about um, students or people that are, that are working, then if there's a desire for them to go to school, then there's, they have limited opportunities here. There is no baccalaureate granting institution within our service district. Uh, Central has a, a site here um, and we've had, four-year schools come and go, but it has been a challenge to have consistency there and connections with the community to sustain the program. Um, one of the criteria we have to address in a BAS application is, are we meeting the needs of place-bound individuals? And that's really the idea behind a bachelor's degree is through the community colleges, meeting the needs of place-bound individuals who for whom it's a barrier to travel to Ellensburg or Eastern or Pullman or Tri-Cities to get it. 
Um, and so we're looking at developing something that would be offered in a hybrid type format in the evening. Some of the work we're doing with our evening programming, again, trying to address the needs of working adults um, who can attend in the evening. What we learn and what we do with our evening program for our associate's degrees will feed into and we'll build upon that for our BAS degrees. Any comments or questions about the BAS? So I'm not going to go into uh, this in detail. There was uh, this is on the portal within the BAS or within the Title V grant. There's several different activities, and because we're over in time, I'm not going to go into this in detail. But these materials did send out. They are on the portal for, uh, that you can look at. But just a couple overarching themes to note. We have kind of three focus areas. One is academic quality, one is assessment evaluation, one of them is communication that are, again, three overarching focus areas for the grant. Within each one of these, we, are, uh, we have activities that we'd be doing as well as a great deal of professional development. One thing that's a little different in this, with this particular grant and our approach to it versus some of the others we've done is the professional development, the activities here are open to everyone at the, at the institution. Whereas in the past sometimes we've, we would have a grant say we're gonna develop X program and so a lot of the professional development was targeted to people tied to that particular program. But I said with the BAS and management, every degree program we have feeds into that. So then if we have professional development around things, every faculty member can access those funds and, and uh, that professional development. So there's a focus on evening and online, the BAS, accelerating English and math, um, variety of uh, professional development that we're looking at, Escalas that uh, Mariah and Johnny and Ryan Duvall went to last summer is one of those things we want to invest in as well as some more with online hybrid teaching. We're doing a lot with assessment and evaluation our work. We know that's going to continue to be an issue for us with uh, accreditation. So putting some resources behind that starting um, assessment fellows where we want to identify some folks receiving an additional stipend per year and get some additional training and leadership in the area of assessment for the campus and put some money into some assessment projects that departments can do and and we want this to include not just faculty but staff as well and then communication both internal communication and communication with uh, with students and their family members and so a variety of activities there and professional development Okay, the last thing that I want to mention to you briefly is recruitment of international students. And as some of you know, I just returned last night from a trip to South Korea. Uh, on the table at the back, there's two sets of uh, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding that, that was signed on that trip. One was with a technical high school and one was with a university. We have a, we visited another technical high school. They've got a great aviation maintenance program, an electrical program. They are planning to, to visit the college here within the next few months. And there was a city I visited in uh, Japan last, uh, last fall. And they're sending a delegation here in the next two weeks, and I'm still trying to nail down the date that they will be coming to Big Bend. That particular city does a lot in the area of the fine arts, and so I'm hoping we can get some connection with some of our uh, faculty from that uh, English and humanities area. So I was hoping to have a date that I could share with you this morning, but I haven't got the email yet. So 
the university that we signed an MOU with, uh, they'll probably be making a visit as well. So why would we bother with international students as a community college? I think that's probably the, one of the big things. So there's a couple things to point out. One is we've been doing international education for longer than any of us have been here. The JATP program we've been doing for 52 years. We've had international aviation students on an ongoing basis. We serve a lot of uh, international students, some of them well, domestic international through our ESL program. But why, why would we invest in that? Why would we care about that? So the primary thing is to strengthen our enrollment in our aviation programs. Why would anyone travel halfway around the world to attend Big Ben? Well, because there is not as much of a nightlife here as there is in Seattle, right? <laughs> There's more of a draw there. There has to be a reason for them to come halfway around the world. And, and what do we have to sell that would, that would be interesting to someone? Well, it's FAA certification in our, in our aviation programs. One of the things that uh, I've learned since I've come here is the, the enrollment trend with aviation is opposite everything else. Because we get en enrollment peaks when the economy is strong, right, John Mark? Because, because people have money. When the economy crashes, they don't have money, they're not coming, right? And I heard some interesting stories when I came about some clashes between the administration and the aviation program, many of you guys were here at the time, um, about the future and the health and what, of the aviation program, whether that was gonna continue or not. And I believe some of that was during the recession when enrollment was down. I can't imagine Big Ben without an aviation program. It's one of the, few, one of the programs that puts us on the map at a state regional level but we wanna preserve the enrollments there. They're hurting right now in, in aviation maintenance, but they're strong in, in flight. And so this is, and so my hope is that we can have some partnerships in place so that at some point we know the economy is gonna take a downturn. And wouldn't it be nice if we had some, some partnerships in place where we had a stream of some international students that kind of pick up the, slap, the slack in enrollment to strengthen those, keep those programs strong so that when we do see that dip, which we know is gonna come at some point, we don't know when, but the economy is always doing this, right? That we have some more stable enrollment for those, for those key programs. The soonest we would probably have any students here would be 2020, and even that it may be ambitious, right? We still have a lot to do there. So, so that's the primary reason. It increases campus diversity, and frankly, it's, we are really, it's really interesting here. We're out in the middle of nowhere, Eastern Washington, but the amount of international business connections we have is astounding. We have Swedish, uh, Chinese, Japanese companies here, just a stone's throw away in the port. We have a few hundred Japanese nationals that are here working through Mitsubishi there's people from the Japanese, the, the equivalent of the, the FAA, the Japanese uh, Aviation Authority, that are going back and forth constantly between Japan and Moses Lake because they're certifying the Mitsubishi along with the FAA here. So we have these very strong, deep international business connections that are part of our community. All the trips that I, I've done, three trips, they've all been in partnership with the port because they're going and recruiting and making connections that we otherwise wouldn't have. We wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't have those connections with the port where they already have business connections and they're introducing us to educators and businesses and they're, they're recruiting for Big Bend. And then when they find, like this last trip, they found a university and a college and a high school in a, in a business trip in Tokyo and then set it up so that when I went over there, then we signed this MOU. And so it's because of that partnership where work, we're working with the economic development folks in our county to strengthen the businesses, international businesses in our county, that's being responsive to our community, right? The last thing on that, we have an MOU, what in the world does that mean? And I've learned a lot in the past year. 
this this whole international student recruiting is kind of a you, we're trying to enter into partnerships with these foreign entities and it's kind of like a dating game we go over there we get introduced we trade our business cards here's who big band is they say here's who we are and then kind of the next step the next date is we invite them over and they come over for a visit to big ben and we had a visit in january from this technical high school in south korea and this technical high school is in a city that's a sister city who has sister city relationship with with the county so again it's building on those economic ties that are already there and so they came over and and uh, they see the college and do a tour then in this last trip i went over and and uh, had a tour of their high school and then we signed the MOU and the MOU basically says we're going to be friends and we've got a serious dating relationship now okay using the dating analogy there's no legal obligation but it says we have a mute some mutual interest that we're going to pursue together and so what we're now working on is a group of their students coming um, students that would be right before they graduate from high school, but will already be 18, coming and enrolling in our classes for a fall quarter of 2020 is the, the project that we're working on with them. And, and uh, we don't really have a project. There was speed dating with that university. We don't have a project we're working on with them, but they hand out MOUs quite frequently. So that's the idea. And again, it's all very aviation focused. Any final questions for me or comments, Terry? Just allow me a couple of minutes here. I, I want to get to the whole point of this. Why are we doing all this? Um, it's fundamental to the purpose of this college, the, the reason we're here. A lot of this we're doing because we want to protect our budget. We want to protect the employment of our employees, uh, the success of our college. But why? Why do we want to do that? Why do we want a college? Stop and think about who we serve. In our service district, we have some of the lowest educational attainment levels in the state. We have some of the lowest household incomes per capita incomes. Those kinds of characteristics, those demographics, generally mean that people aren't gonna be able to achieve the American dream. It's gonna be a struggle. The one sure social elevator is education. So we do this to protect this college. Yes, we're protecting your jobs, our jobs, but we wanna protect the college because the college transforms lives. And in doing so, it provides workforce development, economic development, it enables people to live the American dream. So this is important because you help preserve democracy. Thank you. We will be going to lunch and I have one important very important request on behalf of Bryn and the assessment committee, come back. <laughs> so at one o'clock, um, we will be, we'll reconvene and there's some things with the assessment committee that they'll be sharing, going over some activity and then, and then we'll disperse for your divisional assessment work. But come back one o'clock and enjoy lunch.